I am here with Skinner, uh, part two of our fantastic interview. Uh, did I cut you off in the middle of any thoughts about that sort of feeling of, uh, oh. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the, anyway, so that that's cool that I could put, I could, you know, pay it forward like that because it's, I've like, I look back in my career and it's a series of people who are like helping me or, or believed in me in that moment. And, you know, and so like, I'm, I didn't, I'm not like, just like, I crushed it from day one. I crushed. It's like, I tried, you know, it's like, Oh, I tried really hard. And then ooh, it didn't really, it was kind of worked, but not really. And then it got, you know, it's just, it's kind of like just, if you are strong enough to have things not work for a long time, you could be an artist, <laughs> you know, in, in a lot of ways, it really is just something you need to do. And mm -hmm. then people just realize after decades, <laughs> yeah, now, now I'm starting to kind of get what, what this guy's up to. Right. And, uh, and yeah. Yeah. It takes point, a long time. Like, yeah. 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 I can see that for you specifically that, it it would take a long time because what you're doing is like a meta commentary humorous sort of fun like collective um love letter to jack kirby and comics and it like but as like also like an outlet for your particular brand of 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 humor and like fun, like your good hearted nature and all that. you know it's like i it didn't take me long to get it. I was like, oh yeah, dude. I I I was like on board immediately. <laughs> I did that. That same thing happened to me when um, do you know that artist Pete Von Schally? I don't think so. So um he's this storyboard artist for movies in Hollywood and stuff, but he made all of his old comics. So tomorrow's uh -huh. published one of his magazines that he did. It was like Cooked out crazy monsters gone wild insane totally crazy you know and it, but it for short it was chigwam and i was like oh my god this is amazing like this is crazy dude what chigwam and it's like the funniest it's like a old you know horror magazine and but it's stories written because remember like famous monsters of hollywood stuff like that this is like what that is, except for it's a humorous take. It's a joke. It's like Mad Magazine kind of. Well, I just lost my shit. I was like, this guy's a genius, whatever. And then like, you know, Dave Downey at uh, uh, World's Best Comics is like, well, I'm glad you like him because nobody else does, you know? And I'm like, oh, dude, this guy fucking rocks. Anyways, like 10, 15 years goes by. And I see that he's going to be Pete Von Schally, this guy, like he's going to be at a, uh, um, a convention monster, son of monster. Police. And I'm like, Pete Von Schally. Oh my God. Chigwam. You're a genius. Like whatever. And he's like, Oh, thanks kid. Like whatever. And, and like, this is like nobody at his table at all. So like, I, I, I have a feeling that I've done this to a few <laughs> people where I'm like, you're all, I get it. You're the best. You're great. Like, yeah. And that, um, that book that only six people read, you're the guy who's made for. You see my other dog over here? That's the little yipper. Oh, yipper. I love it. Her name is <laughs> Penny. Oh, that's cute. I thought her name should be Veronica Lake. So I, I still think of her as Veronica Lake. Hmm. Well, <laughs> we, we can all secretly have names for, yeah. for animals. I know I have a million names for my cats and stuff. <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, I mean, it's good that you stuck with it. And, you know, it's obvious to anybody that knows you that you're like extremely creative and that you're not tarnished by the cynicism of, of the universe, it's, you know. It's a struggle sometimes, you know, yeah. you, you got to, I, I find I, I need to keep things in perspective. I, I need to remind myself, I've got a family who loves me. I, I've yeah. Got, two cool kids. I I've got a, I've got a day job, but it's a day job 
that I can do, you know, 20 hours a week and make decent money uh, that affords me the the time and the living to make comics. I, I have to make them a little slower than I might like since I can't do it full time. But uh, yeah, you know, you, you do what you can and uh, be, I guess be thankful for what yeah. you got. Gratitude, <laughs> practicing gratitude is like a, it's, a survival tech mechanism dude mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. sometimes i'm so overwhelmed by the stress and things and emotional problem life problems really personal stuff everything you know mm -hmm. i'm just in bed and i'm like god damn it i just woke up i gotta do another day of all this shit it's kind of <laughs> brutal but then i just sit there and i just i go all right let me feel these warm sheets and like, <laughs> just, and just be in bed and just be like i'm safe i'm like i, I have a place to live I, I i don't have to go dig ditches anymore like i don't have to you know it's like i just go through a list of it's things helpful it, it it, it really makes a difference to to literally list yes. These are nice things about my life because you lose sight of it. it it's so much easier to dwell on the negative you know oh and well we're geared to be negative because that's like a surviving thing like you know and gratitude is you know gratitude and joy are tra transgressive acts in a world that encourages you to feel afraid and nervous and anxious about things they're not being enough and that you need to keep grinding and that if you don't grind you're going to be homeless if you don't make money you're gonna you know it's like it's like this world only exists in the way that it does because we are convinced that if we don't obey through the anxiety and all this stuff that we're going to, our lives are going to be shit. But if you can be grateful and you can be sweet and fun for the things that you do have, it kind of makes it like, well, I don't really need that much. And then all of a sudden you're, it's like the, the capitalist the psychic mechanism of the universe is like, who is this that defies the, me you know and it's like oh i don't know man i'm just i feel like it's fine like i don't need lobster i'm good with like just a chicken leg it's fine <laughs> you know as you say this i i'm thinking back i i wonder if there's some scientific uh explanation uh that, that boils this all back to our, our primal uh beginnings uh and and like you say survival where uh on the one hand the the anxiousness and despair is is maybe what keeps you from thinking oh is is there a tiger in those bushes I, I i gotta you know i gotta protect myself i got i got i gotta get away from here and that that's maybe helped our species survive and and also that fight for survival of oh i, I gotta i gotta work even harder because if i don't that tiger could come get me you know and eat me for dinner <laughs> yeah oh i definitely think that that part of our you know old like our lizard brain surviving and stuff is exploited like i think it keeps us the fear of not enoughness of scarcity keeps us in a place of fear and it's an old old way of of being for humans the the problem is is that there's no tigers around the tigers are the ones we have created by participating in this structure. Now, the now, structure is the tiger. Like, that's what's going on. It's like, you know, there's more than enough for everybody, but nobody, but like collectively, our imaginations are too tired to, to like get us motivated. But I think that collective resistant resistance and like unions and stuff are like the only way that you can keep that shit in check because it's like well what's the antidote to being afraid and it's like community so you get connected to a community and that is why i don't always like art communities because there's a competition there and I'm not here to compete with artists. I'm here to uh, support them and commune with them. 
And so I always try to have like a union mindset with artists where if I don't want a job, even if I'm like too busy or if like something's going on, I will recommend another artist that I, that I know, maybe one that's like needs the job that could do the job or whatever. Or like, I know that if I get like a really good pay, like a payday from like a little company or something or some, you know, and I know like I'll kind of talk to them and be like, Oh, who, who are you working with? You know, whatever, who, who you got, you know, as I'm turning in my project and shit, I'm like, oh, we got this person next. We're we're working with whatever. I'll reach out to that person, uh, the artist, and be like, hey, just so you know, this is what I got, and this is how I negotiated, and this is what you could get if you wanted it. And they're like, wow, thanks. And I go, yeah. So, anyways, don't tell them I told you whatever. <laughs> and so, like, that's just how I am. I, I just I want artists to be taken care of, and I realize that the bar I set for myself is not just a bar that I'm setting for me. It's a bar. It's like the way I want to be treated is the way I want other people to be treated too, uh, other creatives. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about 20 years ago, how uh, no artists, no comics artists used to charge for their signatures. And over time that's changed. And uh, now a lot of comics artists do charge for their signatures. And, and similarly, artists 20 years ago, everybody used to just give you a free sketch. And, mm -hmm. and nowadays, you know, they're doing 50 or 100 or $1,000 sketches at conventions and things. And, and uh, artists are slowly realizing to try and uh, get, get some respect for, and, and, and just acknowledgement. Hey, this, this is worth something and this is how I make my living, you know. And boiling it back again to, to the tribes of the primal past, mm -hmm. uh, humanity has this history of doing amazing acts of love and kindness mm. and amazing acts of barbarity. And mm -hmm. it, it seems to be from this feeling of you're of my tribe or you're not of my tribe, right? Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're in the tribe, we'll, we'll take off our shirts to keep you warm. We'll, we'll feed you our own food to make sure that you're, you're getting nourished. It's, it's when someone's outside of your tribe that it's like, oh, you know, you, you look at politics today and, uh, you know, global problems. And it, it's always about other, right, as, as yeah. opposed to us. And mm -hmm. um, so what, what we're talking about here is how do we make the comics community us and the tribe and how do we protect the tribe and make sure the tribe is fed, right, and cared for. Yeah, I think that there is sort of a class consciousness, I think, that comes from seeing so much exploitation. I think that there's like a balance that traditionally has been reserved for uh, because like a company is like, OK, we're going to pay you to do this comic and you get paid like this and then we're going to give you residuals or whatever if you're like a big dog like john Byrne or something back in the day you know and because it's like you're being kind of recognized for how the books are selling etc 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 but what happens is and what i've seen is that over time you know of course the comics industry has shifted you know where it's like selling a million comics is not it's not going to happen you know, um, where it used to, uh, because of speculation, but anyway, so it's like, you know, it's, it's like that you, you get, it's like, Hey, we want you to take less money and then the residuals dry up. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, the comic book companies are making a lot of money. We're doing the labor. We're not being cut in on the profits, but we're like, it's okay. It's enough to live or whatever, whatever. But it, it gets in a lot of these industries, it gets more and more and more that like the people who are the industry, the creatives are being asked to take less and less or whatever and the pressure. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, now all of a sudden the pressure gets to a point where it's boiling everything. Right. And so you can either 
be competitive and be like, I'll do it instead of you. Or you can say, well, no, let's collectively just say, we're not going to do this unless we get more money or something. Those moments are when the cohesion happens with the collective, you know, resistance to that stuff and collective class understanding that like, oh, actually we separately are exploited like crazy, but collectively have the ability to negotiate more for us and to be taken care of like, oh, interesting. The the problems that these these companies do is that they're massive corporate giants that have been bought, you know, and they're whatever. And so it's just like lawyers who are just like, nah, dude, crush them down, crush them and smash them down, like whatever. So it's not even like you could go talk to a boss and be like, hey, so just so you know, like we're going to strike if you keep fucking up and like we want this or whatever. It's not that. It's just this like negotiations with lawyers and massive shit. And so with artwork, art and stuff that's outside of comics, I feel like it's more, there is no specific industry. It's like, I'm kind of jumping around from here to there doing this and doing that and all this stuff, doing my own projects and everything. I just sort of take it upon myself. It's like, um, you know, circumstance to circumstance to share my information with people and all this stuff. And that's why it also kind of frustrates me when I see like a bigger artist, like taking less, or I know they did it. They didn't, they took, or they just did it pro bono type shit. And I'm like, dude, you're setting an example for all of us, you know? And so I don't know. I, I, all of us. yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like, dude, now, like, what am I supposed to be able to like ask for what I need after you did? Like, that's yeah. now my now my fight is more up uphill because they, of they sold their nice house in a nice neighborhood for cheap, and now none of the houses in the neighborhood are worth anything. <laughs> exactly, bro. Yeah, I live in a sewer now, like a Ninja Turtle, Skinja Turtle. That's me. <laughs> but i don't know i mean i'm just doing my best and trying to help and stuff i think with comics like it's really interesting to see what the how how did the image comics union thing work out did that work at all or what what happened oh, i i haven't been reading up seemed like that was a thing but i haven't heard nothing about it you know but like dude think about image comics those guys called their bluff called marvel and dc's bluff and we're like nah we're out and you know the 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 mastermind behind all that shit was todd mcfarland and like he's a he's a crazy weird dude but like you know what in his mind he knew he had like a vow he's like no i'm worth this and it would not have surprised me if if the other people in image com in, that he gathered for image comics left if if they didn't want to do it, it wouldn't surprise me that he wouldn't have just done it himself by himself. Like I, I bet you he would have just be like, I'm do I'm going independent, spawned. What do you you know? Anyway, I don't know, whatever. I'm talking about Todd McFarlane. <laughs> when when we hung up from our last call, I said, Oh, I want to talk about your career. And and oh, we've right. gone another, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can be no, fast. That's, about that's it. great. This this is all great. Um, sorry, Chris. Nothing to apologize about. This is what I want to do, though. Yeah. I want to ask you, because this this kind of got touched on in, in some of the previous stuff. Did you start trying to make comics? And then you kind of wound up into this other stuff, or were you doing a little of everything? I, I'm thinking of your early art days. When I first knew you, I, I feel like you were maybe doing t-shirts and posters, but did you have comics also? No, I was too intimidated by it. Okay. So you you were inspired by all these comics creators. Mm -hmm. What what made you choose with those as your inspiration that you were going to do this stuff instead? Well, I always felt like comics were was amazing, but I, I always felt like dude, this is way too much work and there's too many fundamentals and there's too much to learn and it's so much drawing. And it's like 
hours and hours and hours and weeks and weeks of drawing so that somebody will look at it for two seconds. Like, hell no. And, uh, but I had a great reverence for it. I was just like intimidated and I think was like a little bit honest with myself about what my skill set was, my skill level. And so uh, I was like doing, I saw Juxtapose magazine and I was, I was thinking to myself, Hey, this is interesting. I could probably do this, you know, and I had no money. I had no uh, college degree or nothing like that. And so I was like, well, I could, I could draw, I can get fairly motivated and whatnot. And um, so I started doing these paintings and learning and I was teaching art at a short, uh, an art program for people with developmental disabilities for 10 years. And I was like doing art there with them and we'd hang out and I'd look at juxtapose and I would daydream about God, it would be so cool if I could just do this art thing for a living. And like, I don't know. And I was just like looking at it. And so I would just daydream and think about what it, what it would look like, you know, and, and I was just studying that stuff and looking. And so I'd go down to San Francisco to art, art galleries and look at things. And it's like, God, this feels possible somehow. And um, another uh, guy from Sacramento, Alex Pardee, do you remember him? So he, so he like got on the cover of juxtapose and I was like, holy shit, man. I know this person. This is insane. He had moved to San Francisco at that time or something. Yeah. What I was going to say is I, I didn't realize he was a Sacramento person. He lived in SAC for a long time. So he, he was the first artist on Sam Keith's Ojo and he had to duck out and Sam wound up having me finish the series. So that's how I got to know him a little bit. Oh, interesting. Like, like we were, we were two passing ships, right? Uh, wow. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, so yeah, I was like, all right. So I was starting to do more art shows and I would drive down to San Francisco all the time after work to hang out and try to integrate myself. And I was curating shows and, uh, you know, getting in there and trying real hard. And this was like the heyday of juxtaposed with weird art and tri trippy shit. So I was like, dude, I think I, I, I'm, in, I'm in, man. And I was really trying. I was painting. I was like, what do I like to do? I want to make creatures with big weird headdresses and trippy shit and monsters and psychedelic stuff and mythology and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, there's a place for this anyway. So then I just... What I've got a question. Was it when you left Sacramento that you started feeling like you had success? Oh, no, I was in SAC. I was in Sacramento and I was. I did. I left Sacramento 11 years ago, I think. And um, I. Uh, but I was in SAC and it was like there was not a lot of opportunities there. There was a lot of people doing stuff, but it was all outside of Sacramento. Like there was the the toy room art gallery, which I would show at. And that was cool. They were really cool. And they would help me try to get into juxtapose. And they were really awesome. And uh, but it wasn't until I was showing paintings at Super 7 Toy uh, Company in Japantown that I got a little blurb and a little thing. And I was like, yes, it's working, dude. Fucking yeah. And, uh, and I was just selling paintings kind of like as I'd make them hundred bucks, 300 bucks, 200, you know, 500 bucks, whatever, whatever. And, uh, I started doing, then I was like, okay, I'm going to do illustrations for shirts and bands. And because you, you realize, well, I realized very quickly that I needed to diversify the hustle. So I was like, I'll do shirts for bands. I'll do illustrations. I'll paint toys. I'll make paintings. I'll, I'll screen print my own shirts. I'll do little booths at Alternative Press Expo. I'll do prints. I'll do whatever. I didn't feel like I was that great of an illustrator. It was very raw, you know, rudimentary kind of shit. But that was sort of popular at the time. So I was like, okay, the trend is around where my skill level is. So I'm feeling very good about this. And um, so then I would just, I, I remember I built my way up until I had like, you know, a feature in juxtapose. I was getting out there more. I was in Thrasher magazine and doing 
you know, conventions and flying around and going to New York and doing murals and all this crazy shit, you I know. I ask about the murals, how that fell in. Was, was that uh, paid work? Oh, yeah, you, you get paid for it. I mean, sometimes I do stuff for free or whatever, or like, you know, if I'm just in another city and there's supplies there, I'll just start blasting something crazy or whatever. But like, yeah, I mean... I just realized that I think there's like a moment where I was like, dude, it's literally, I am in control of, of my destiny via how much effort I'm putting out. And I noticed that the more effort I was putting out, I was seeing a return on interest like of me and what I was doing and stuff. And some of it was just driving to a place and being like, hi, I'm Skinner. Nice to meet you. You know, like I, I, there's a really interesting short anecdote was that when I was, I was really trying to, there was a graffiti artist named Bigfoot in uh, San Francisco and he would paint these Bigfoots around. And I was like, that's cool. I like it. I like Bigfoot. That's cool. I wanted him to go to my art show at the Minna gallery, I had this big wall of paintings and all this crazy shit that I curated a show. So I was like, Ooh, he's having a show in San Francisco. I drive down there. I paint a little painting and I wrap it up in, in, you know, comics and make a little gift, right? Little one, small. And I'm like, Ooh. And, and I saw him and I was, I'm going to talk to him, you know? And he was super wasted, like insanely wasted. And I was like, ah, shit. Well, whatever. So I go up and I put, I, he's got a leather jacket on. I put the painting in his pocket. He's too wasted. He doesn't know. And uh, I was like, well, whatever. He'll see. Um, he, he'll see it or he won't. I don't know. And, uh, and then I get a phone call the next day from him and he's like, Oh, what's up, man? You gave me a painting this t this tie. I, I was like, how'd you get my phone number? <laughs> he's like, Oh, I went to your art show. I looked your name up and saw it. And like what I went to the, the mini gallery, I saw it. And then they gave me your phone number. And I was like, dude, amazing. Thank you. And he's all, Hey, uh, I'll... this was back when Scion, the car company was, put dumping millions of dollars into subcultures to try to get credibility and stuff. And so they were like dumping money into juxtaposed stuff. And they said, we're having a big gallery show. Uh, Bigfoot's curating it. It's going to be a big thing in San Francisco. And he said, Hey, do you want to be in this with me? And I was like, hell yeah. So then like that, so, do you see what I'm saying? Like, this is sort of how I've done this where I just go, fuck, I'm going to put myself in a position to meet somebody. Oh, it didn't work. Oh, well, let it go. Whatever. Something happens. Cool. Now it's happening. Now it's a And then so I have a painting, a couple of big paintings that are crazy in the Scion show. Who knows if that affected me at all or not? I don't know. But it was like one of the first times I was like showing in a cool big gallery with these like bigger name artists and all this stuff. So that's sort of just the way things have gone for me early on. And I kind of just tried to create opportunities for myself through action and directly just being like, Hey, I'm here, whatever. Now I'm sure there's a lot of, of memories people have of me where they're like, yeah, you were a, an asshole and obnoxious and thirsty for success and all this stuff. Probably true. Deeply motivated by desperation though. And, and yeah, <laughs> and motivation I needed and, and, you know, I needed to get, I needed to get ahead and I was, there was no, there was nothing that, you know, I could do. I mean, I, I, I realized too, like I was like trying to curate shows where I'm like Sacramento artists, like, look at this and all this shit. And what I realized was they were not putting as much effort in, into the like goal that I had of like trying to put Sacramento on, on the map and trying to do this stuff. And so I was like, you know what? 
this isn't really working that good for me. So as soon as I just said, you know what, I'm just going to do a show for my stuff and my art. That's when it started to like really go. And I kind of have an inherent sort of thing where I'm like, no, I want things to be collective and together. But I realized I don't really have any juice. I, I don't, I'm not famous. I'm not anybody. So it's like, I can't even really help these people, even if I get them an opportunity. It's like, they're people are like, what, who cares? So I was like, well, let me go do my best and try to get some success or notoriety so that I can get stability in my career, which is extremely difficult to do. Yeah. And then after that, I was like able to like kind of like help out when I could here and there and, you know, put somebody on, introduce somebody to this person and that person, all this stuff. But until I had my own credibility, I wasn't really in a position to help, you know? Yeah. So. When, when did you know it was time to go full on and uh, do away with your day job? Well, I definitely was creating over like a couple of years, I had made an extreme goal of like, I am going to do art for a living. I have got to do this because, you know, not, not to be, you know, too brutal or anything, but like all my coworkers at short center were like 50 years old, 60 years old artists that never really tried to, you know, like, it seemed to me that they were just real comfortable and they were chilling there. And I was thinking to myself, like, I don't want to, I don't want this to be like my future, not to be negative about that. I'm just saying it this is the path me. you wanted to take. Right. And so I, I was like getting jobs and doing things and trying to build my career and stuff so that I would be able to jump off and it wouldn't be so scary and, and hard. Well, in a work meeting, I told my boss, I thought he was ruining the program and that he was messing it up. And so then I was fired that day. And, uh, and then uh, I you got probably knew you, you were probably in the back of the, your head thinking, how can I get out of this and devote myself to my art? Right. Yeah, and, <laughs> yep. And then I was like, okay, now I'm, I, I'm not working there anymore. I'm getting unemployment. And then after like a month and a half of getting unemployment, I filled out the form wrong. And then they were like, you can't, you're not getting any more money. And I was like, damn it. Shit. And this was in uh, 2008 when the economy crashed. And I was like, fuck, now I got to hustle. Fuck shit. And then I was like 16 hours a day, 17 hours a day, drawing and painting and doing hustling and hustling and hustling. And um, I figured if not now, I don't know when, you know, and uh, I just did my best. And now you here I am. the situation for yourself that you had to live uh, as an artist, right? To survive. <laughs> right. I mean, Dude, desperation and motivation and hustle. I mean, it's like, if you're comfortable, you're not gonna, a lot of times it's like, you don't, you're like, I'm just gonna chill, you know? But like, I was like, dude, if I don't get my shit together, this is really not gonna happen. Yeah. And I, somehow it was a miracle. I don't, I don't I have no idea how, but I mean, I would be like borrowing $60 from my mom for a week's worth of burritos and then paying her back at the end of the week so that I could borrow another 60 bucks on Monday. And you know what I mean? Like I was like, it was not dude. It's not, it wasn't like glory at all. It's, <laughs> it was like extremely brutal, but I think that if you want to know what you're capable of, you could put yourself in a position like that. And Sacramento definitely in that time period, it was like boot camp. It was like, oh, you think you're special? Yeah, prove it. It's kind of like you suck until further notice. <laughs> no, it's like, so I'm just like, ah, I gotta go. Ah, I gotta grind. I gotta hustle. Ah. You know? And so I don't know. I, I think that it was, those those early comic cons and all those things we would go to like i think it was just really cool to be like okay these people are doing it maybe i could do it so even though i was encouraging you 
I think that probably just seeing you having the audacity to exist in in those spaces in this world i was like all right maybe i could do this shit too you know maybe let's see let's see what happens let's see. hey this chris wisney guy is pretty crazy let's see what i could do i had no idea that that i helped in encouraging that that you're pretty much totally responsible for my career what the no way <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were tabling at the same time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we were, dude. It was all a dream. You're welcome, the world, for Skinner. <laughs> now we know who to blame. <laughs> it is always such a pleasure to spend time with you, Skinner. Thank you so much for of course. with me. Of course, brother. Any Anytime. Any, uh, parting thoughts <laughs> oh yeah um, to share oh yeah take care like just take care of yourself don't be on the internet too much mm. be great be grateful be kind make connections with people be curious about others um and do whatever you can to maintain your humanity in a world that wants you to abandon it for convenience. That's all. Amen, brother. Amen. All right. I'm going to turn off the recording. Thanks again, Skinner. This was great. Of course. How do I turn off the recording? <laughs>